I'm recording. How am I recording? Okay. All right. Good morning. We're going to open in prayer, everyone. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each one that's in this class right now, Lord. And thank you for our wonderful celebrations over the holidays, Christmas, New Year's, Lord, where we could be with friends and family if possible. I just thank you for your tender mercies. Bless the speaker this morning as he gives us insight in um, his knowledge base, Lord. I pray for uh, miracles to occur in each one of our lives going forward, 2022, Lord. And just help us keep our eyes focused on you. And just like Jacob, we got that ladder going up and down. We've got angels around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And with that, I hand the table and chair <laughs> to our good friend, Lou Chavez. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lou Chavez. I am an independent business broker. I am also a realtor, a Broker and associate with EXP Realty. With EXP Realty, I sell residential. As an independent business broker, I sell businesses. Businesses, the American dream. Small business ownership. A lot of people think about the American dream. Owning your own business. A business is a lot different than a job. A job you go to for eight hours a day, five days a week, and stay working. I used to be a safety inspector for the government. And I'd walk into the government buildings and I'd be talking to the people and they'd say, I would always look at me and say, when I retire, I want to get me a small little bar and just sit back. When I retire, I'm going to get me a small little, they always say about what they're going to retire. If you're doing what you like to do and get paid for it, that's living. An example of that is a while back, I was selling a restaurant and I happened to go into Del Mar, uh, one of the Del Mar restaurants and I asked for the owner. The owner wasn't there, but I asked the manager. And I asked the manager, I said, uh, you have an excellent place here. How'd you like to own a restaurant? Believe it or not, the manager of the restaurant looked at me and says, I would never own a restaurant. And I looked at him puzzled. This is what, what would you like to be doing? He says, I would like to be fishing all day long. <laughs> I kept that in mind, and within six months' time, I came across a fishing charter boat that was for sale. That young man now is getting paid, fishing all day, doing exactly what he wants to do. He does not have a job anymore. He's living his life. As important drivers of the employment and the economy, Small business owners are the key to the American success, to the American economy. When investors succeed, small business owners are reward, rewarded both financially and with the knowledge that they've made a positive contribution to the communities. However, entrepreneurship is not easy. How to succeed in business? Well, you need a business plan. Everybody talks about a business plan. The business plan should also have an executive summary, which is a description of exactly what the business is going to be all about, goals and objectives. You need a marketing plan. You need an operations plan. You need a management plan. You need a financial plan. When I say financial plan, I'm talking about the cash flow projections. And most importantly, you need an exit plan. That's right. The written business plan and the financial plan, the cash flow projections, are extremely vital to get started and continuing successfully. A cash flow projection is like a budget, but unlike the estimating revenues and expenses, it estimates cash coming in and cash coming out based on the business performance. Well, can you explain what it means when you said exit plan? So many people have an excellent business going on. An example of that would be a restaurant that I had in downtown San Diego. 
It had been very successful for several years. However, the gentleman had a stroke. And once he had a stroke, he couldn't function properly. He was an elderly gentleman, but he called his son, who was in San Francisco. He called his daughter, who was in New York, to help him out. They stayed for a few months helping him out, but they couldn't really help it out. The son wanted to return back to San Francisco and continue his career as an attorney. The daughter, she was a, a, a dancer up in New York, and she wanted to go back to New York and, and, and continue her, her career. career as a dancer. He was in his 80s, early 80s, and was dragging himself, trying to get things together. His intention was always to let his children carry on the business. But when the children grew up, they looked at him and said, Dad, I've been doing this all my life. I don't want to run a restaurant again. That's one case. Another case is, let's say, for some reason or other, after 30 years of doing the same business, you say it's time to retire. So you get the situation where, for medical reasons, physical reasons, financial reasons, a business is going to close down. You put your body, you put your blood, sweat, and tears into the business. Do you just want to walk away, close the doors? No, the exit plan is to have something prepared, something ready, so that when you decide that it's time to step away from the business, you don't just close the doors and walk away. You've got too much equity. You've got too much goodwill already invested in there. Yes, sir. I'd like to, um, thank you very much. The um, executive summary, that's uh, sometimes confusing because it's at the beginning of the business plan and it seems where is the summary you'd be at the end. But the executive uh, summary is very important because it's at the beginning and it gives the whole general idea of your business in that one, well, let's call it chapter. And uh, it can really be important because sometimes they don't go on to the operations, the management plan, financial plan, if they can't get past the executive summary. And that's usually right at the very beginning of your business plan. And that gives the entrepreneur's idea of the whole business. Very important. It is very important because at the beginning, you set up your objectives and you set your goals. Your objective is you're going to be selling or you're going to be servicing XYZ item or product. XYZ is going to be targeted. Your goal is now your target audience. You're going to go to a target audience of 18, 25 years old, 40 to 45 years old, uh, right-handed people, left-handed people. What is your target audience? That is your goal. You don't just say, I'm going to sell XYZ to everybody. Everybody doesn't want XYZ. Everybody doesn't need XYZ. So you have to determine exactly who your target items is. Your marketing is going to fall into that. Are you going to market to the entire world? Says, hey, I've got XYZ products here. What about the people in ABC don't like a XYZ? Case in point, uh, a Mexican restaurant here in San Diego had excellent menudo on Saturdays and Sundays. And this is, well, I'm going to open another, another restaurant up in, 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 in Lakeside. First place was in San Isidro. Second place was in Lakeside. Menudo goes excellent in San Isidro. How well did it go in Lakeside? Oh, in that, the people in one place might not like the same thing. Might be the same item, same recipe and everything, but it's the people's taste. That's your target item, higher target items. So that's what I say. So you have your executive summary. What is your goals? What is your objective? Any more questions? I just, I'm gonna I'm gonna read uh, Byron put on the uh, Zoom. He said business succession plan contingencies for what ifs partner coverage. So that's his injection. That is exactly right. Succession plan. Your succession plan can be oh my son is gonna take over the business. My son might have different ideas, different impressions mm -hmm. as to what he wants to do. My daughter's going to take over the business. Your daughter's husband might not want to be into that business as well. The cash flow projection is like a budget, but rather than estimating revenues and expenses, 
estimates cash coming in and cash going out. It might sound like something that an accountant would be doing, but it's very important for a business. I don't know if you can see the entire uh, schedule that I have here, but that's from June to November. It tells you exactly how much money is coming in. Operating cash you're getting, $19,000. Cash revenue is coming in, $65,000. Cash for deposits, $10,000. So sources of income coming in, you got $94,000. That's good. But you also have the other ex expenses, payroll, 20,000. Accounts payable, 18,000. Overhead, rent, 16,000. Owner's compensation, you gotta pay the owner, 16,000. Line of credit payments, long-term principles. You come down to $1,000, well, use of money, 93,000 out of the 94,000, you have only have $1,000 set at the end, end, end of the month. So you start next month with $1,000 and you work your way down. This tells you exactly how much money is coming in and how much money is coming out. Your vendor who is going to get paid in 30 or 40 days, you have to take into account that, wait a minute, I'm going to have to have another $10,000 come August just to make this. This is a continuing thing where you have to know exactly where you're at, where you're standing at. It tells you how much money is coming in and how much money is going out based on your, your and also, Lou, what that helps do is keep the business money separate from your personal money. I've had it many times where my personal money will get washed in with the business money, and I'll take a little bit of the business money out from my personal, and it all gets foggy. So, absolutely, keeping that right to a T keeps you separate from your personal money, and you need to do that. It helps you identify potential problems. It decreases the impact of cash shortages. It helps keep the suppliers and employees happy. How to succeed in business. You just get into the business. What's the best way to do it? Well, first of all, there's some money, money out there for funding, but it's normally available only for people that have good personal credit. Mm -hmm. New business owners are always advised to check the credit, credit scores with Experian, Equimax, Trans, TransUnion via the annualcreditreport.com. You can go there, find out exactly what the credit reports say about you, see if there's any mistakes, and contact your creditors and make corrections and ideas. They'll also tell you ways on how to improve your credit. That's free. That's something that every business owner should be doing. So what's a good score? That all depends on the, the business that you want to get into. They'll look at it and says, okay, well, uh, I, I can't really, it's it, it's based individually on, on the business that, 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 that the amount of money. Exactly, depending on the kind of money that you're going to be needing, how you're going to be doing it. Uh, bars and, and bars, very hard to get funding for a bar. Yes, why? Why? <laughs> Well, you might have a great bar with a great entertainment on there. And all of a sudden, somebody walks in and starts smashing uh, the place down for you. Well, guess who's responsible? You are. Oh, this liability is usually a problem bar. A excellent bar that was up in the North County. to a great business. All of a sudden, they got closed down. Why? Why? Because okay. a bartender was selling cocaine from behind a bar. Not the owner, the bartender. So the owner lost the license, lost the business, all because the bartender, who wasn't the owner, was selling cocaine behind the bar. It's not a Had nothing to do with the owner. So you're saying that the company had an so what I'm hearing you saying is that it's an area so fraught with unforeseen black swans that people don't want to invest. Am I, am I, am I, or they don't want to fund it. Am I right? Am I it's, right? It, it's not just people that don't want to fund it. SBA will look at you and say, oh, you want to run a nightclub? <laughs> no, I don't think so. You want to run a, a four-star restaurant? Yes, we'll, 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 we'll support your four-star restaurant. A bar, for some reason, it has too many unforeseen contingencies that will destroy the business. You know, there's certain areas of law where the insurance is very high. And I, and, and 
surprisingly, the area where there's a lot of churches is corporate law, lawsuits or like uh, stocks, um, stuff like that. We're right. doing corporate law, very high insurance rate. So interesting. Well, that's a good comparable right there. Um, I'd also like to comment um, that um, the white lenders or banks don't like to loan to nightclubs is because nightclubs are too much fun. They're way too much fun. It's easy for the owner to lose it. There's money, cash flowing in. There's big money in alcohol. And it, it, it is, it's, and nothing really good comes from alcohol. But um, there's big money in it and it can lead you astray. And it's a lot of fun, these places, and it's hard to stay in control. But also, Hawaii, they don't like to loan money on things like um, alcohol licenses, is the liability. Because a person can go to one bar and drink till they get shut off. And then they stumble into another bar. And all they have to do is just say, but and they get a beer and they drink that beer and they drive off and they crash into a telephone pole. Well, the last person that served that last drink, that bar is responsible. And it's very, very easy to be the responsible one when somebody just stumbled up to a bar and said, bud, you give them a Budweiser and they drive off and crack their car when they got tanked up at the place before. Liability is high. One quick little one too. I had a lady leave my establishment and the glass door on the way out got her on the heel, the Achilles tendon type heel. And she immediately tried to file a lawsuit against me and come after me. But however, that door was owned by the mall. So the mall had to pick up the tab. But there's all kinds of liability. It's kind of like a scale. The more money you make, the more liability you have in that type of business. I'm glad you brought that point up because you don't just have to be a customer who goes to a bar and then goes out driving and, 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 and gets in trouble. What about the customer who's dancing wildly, decides to dance on the table, falls down and breaks your back? Right. Who do you think she's going to sue? Mm. Wow. Exactly. How to succeed in business? You got to satisfy your customers. You mentioned earlier that this, you have to have the objectives and goals of business. What are your objectives and goals? Sometimes you have a business and you want to add more things to it. You add more things to it and you forget your customer base. You got to satisfy your customer base to begin with. You can't start with all kinds of things that are going on. As well as you got to satisfy your customers. A surprising 14% of businesses that have failed basically said that they got cut off too much in doing other things other than the business. Mm. They're trying to build up the business. They're trying to do this. They're trying to do that. And they forgot about the customers. You have to satisfy your customers that you're serving to begin with. You utilize your network. People in your network might be your first customers. Nice. But don't just stop there. Expand your network. Use your network effectively and with enthusiasm. Give them more than what you're actually receiving and your business will actually be growing even more. What percentages of businesses fail? According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 20% of small businesses fail within the first year. By the end of the fifth year, only 50% of the businesses are still going on. After 10 years, only 10%, one third of the businesses have survived. I have this little card. Whenever I see a neighborhood, that I have a client that wants to buy a business in, I'll go up and down the street before the business opens and I'll slide these cards underneath the door. Nice. Why do I slide it underneath the door? Because I can't put it in a mailbox. It doesn't have a stamp. It's I'm not a post, postman, but if I slip it underneath the door, the first person who opens that door is normally the owner of the business. And they'll see the card. And they'd ask them, blood, sweat, and tears went into your small business. How will it come to an end? Everybody tells them about the business plan. Everybody tells them about the marketing plan. Everybody tells them about the operations plan. How often do they actually talk about an exit plan? 
Yeah, and that's where I go. <laughs> by the way, if you go by the coffee containers that we have out here, the condiments, you'll see a little uh, table that has a lot of these cards. On the back side, it tells, gives a brief explanation as to how I go about selling businesses and if they could use my help. I secure a lot of businesses by doing it this way. And I'm asking for your help on doing that as well. Pick up a card. If you know a business is thinking about selling or might be selling, slide it to them. And I'm gonna do this one, one thing, is I can't give out referrals unless you guys are licensed agents as well. But I can make donations. Now, if you write on the back of this card, B, four, C, it'll be the code that somebody in this group recommended that individual. I will in turn donate 10% of the commissions that I earned from that business to Skyline. Hey, Lou, could I just do one comment on the exit plan? I yes, didn't sir. get a chance, you kept going right along. But that exit plan is so important if you have a partner, if you're in partners or uh, multiple partners, the exit plan. You know, the exit plan can be one thing if you're just yourself, but when you got a partner, you don't want to exit and be fighting and, and suing and on and on. So the exit plan are very important for partnerships. I am very glad that you pointed that out because I didn't want to push that angle when I was talking about health reasons, financial reasons, and retirement reasons. Your partner, your wife or your husband, when you guys split, and I hate to talk about divorce, but it happens a lot in businesses. You have a husband and wife that have a successful business, and all of a sudden they're going to split. That, in essence, is a partnership split. Whoa. By the way, very well said. A, a divorce is the dissolution of a partnership, and people don't understand that. And so when you have a business, the person who gets the business has to buy out who? He or she from the business. So unfortunately, I know a lot of business law. <laughs> So when you're looking at exit plans, you have to also consider your marriage. California has over 90% of its attorneys in the nation here in California. And what do they do? They certainly push divorce. Hey, what? Divorce. Divorce. You're seeing on the billboards. Dissolution of marriage. Whether it's dissolution of marriage, it's also dissolution of partnership. <laughs> and you know what? It has to be like. Only 78.5% of small businesses survive after the first year. 29% of them fail because they run out of cash. New beginnings can be tough, especially for entrepreneurs. 21.5% of small businesses end their journeys the first year. Only half of the businesses manage to reach the fifth year. Only one third of them go to the 10 year mark. Restaurant failure rate. A lot of people think, well, restaurants was failed quite quite a bit. It's actually quite the opposite. The survival rate of the tenure mark is markedly improved for restaurants. 57.6% of group service businesses established in 2010 were still in business in 2019. Whereas only 38% of the other businesses failed completely. The American dream home ownership. When people hear the American dream, they always think about home ownership. I talk about business ownership, but home ownership, how does that relate to this? When you want to be a, be a homeowner, what do you do? Do you go out there and buy a plot of land? Do you drill a well? Do you put in the septic system? Would you clear and grade the land? Drop the, the architect plans, turn it into the zoning? Could you pour the foundation, set up the foundation, set up the framing, pitch the roof, wire the structure, install the drain and sewers as well as heating services? What about the windows and doors, counters and floors? By the time you get down to all this thing, you say, what? There's got to be an easier way. And there is. You go buy a house from a builder. 
How do you build a, you buy a house from some house that's already built? How does this apply to a business? It's a turnkey business. Nice. A turnkey business is an operation that you can just open the doors and let your customers start coming in and you operate the business right off hand. Franchises are a prime example of a turnkey business. <laughs> McDonald's, Subway, restaurants, there are examples of, fr uh, of franchise. A turnkey business already has a proven business model. A turnkey business already has everything in place. Equipment in place, lease in place, employees are also in place. A franchise will also provide you marketing and support. Warning them, every franchise is not the same. And legislation for controlling franchises is not the same in region per region, even if it exists at all. An example of that, a gas station that gas station owner used to put his Christmas trees out during Christmas season to sell Christmas trees and every season he'd be selling something. He went from a no, a, a no name brand gas station to a brand name gas station. Well, the brand name gas station prohibited him from selling anything else other than their products. And what is their products? Let's say you have a, this, this wasn't the, the name of it, but say XYZ, no name brand, you have a gas station, you can do whatever you want to. You want to sell used cars in the lot, sell used cars in the lot. You want to have a mechanic that does this, have a mechanic that does this. But then you go to Arco, you go to Chevron, and you say, well, I'm going to have a, my, my Christmas tree sale here. No, you can't. Well, I'm going to have a, a yard sale here. No, you can't. I'm going to sell used cars here. No, you can't. The things that you can do as an independent are restricted when you're working with a franchise. That's right. May I have just a quick comment? Yes, sir. Uh, franchise, lots of times, isn't really viewed too highly on entrepreneurs because um, a franchise can easily be you buying a job. You don't want to just buy a job. And like you say, if you bought a subway or whatever, you can't do what you want. You have to put out their products and their signs. Um, and a franchise is something all set up. And to me, it's more like a person that just wants to go into a business because an entrepreneur, let's pick subway. Yeah, you know, you buy a subway, okay, you're in business, but you kind of bought yourself a job. And um, an entrepreneur would walk in and say, well, I'm not gonna pay for this franchise. I'm just gonna go do it myself. I'll build a counter, I'll slice some meat, I'll get some bread. And that's more the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, so just a little warning on franchises. It might seem easy, but you, again, for the third time, it's kind of like you're buying yourself a job and you are very restricted. Now you get a couple of McDonald's under your belt, and then okay, you're up there. That's, that's different. But an entrepreneur would walk in and just say, I do this myself. I'm not going to buy a franchise. From one million to two point two dollars, and you have to have liquid assets of five hundred thousand dollars on there. Your franchise fee for one year is forty-five thousand dollars a month. That's my McDonald's franchise. Damn. <laughs> so if you don't own the land, do you? No, you don't own the land either. No. Franchise can be very restrictive, which we talk about. When you buy an already established business. You have to do a lot of investigations and due diligence. You also have to have the, the business properly assessed as the best business valuation. Whether buying or selling a business, you're going to need somebody that can locate and identify viable target opportunities. When I say viable target opportunities, I'm talking about the business itself, I'm talking about the customers itself that meet specific criteria. You have to have someone who can obtain entity information, understand the letters of intent, and initiate negotiations. You need someone that can be efficient negotiator, understand written contracts, written offers, counter offers, and lease agreements, 
You need someone who can advise and assist in performing the required due diligence, financial review, and SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis is, is, is when you look at a business and look at the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that the business is, is looking at you. If you don't do that, you don't know exactly what, what you're getting into. Yes, SWOT, did you go over what that acronym stands for? SWOT, strength, strength, weaknesses, weaknesses, opportunities, opportunities, and threats. threats. Never heard that before. You have someone who can arrange and coordinate the opening of escrow, prepare the escrow instructions, and follow through to the close of escrow. Confidentiality and discretion matters a lot when you sell a business or buying a business. You see a business that's for sale. It's normally by non-disclosure agreement that you get to know what business is available. Because if you're selling a business, you don't want the thousand and one customers going in and say, hi, I understand you guys are for sale. The first thing that your employees are going to do is say, I better find me another job. Whoa. Your suppliers can say, I can't give this person any credit anymore. I have to get paid right up front. Your competitors say, hey, he's going out of business. He's, going out of business. he's no good. <laughs> so if the wrong person finds out that the business is for sale, you could lose the entire business. Uh, I'm just going to interject one thing. A friend of mine years ago, I would say like 40 years ago, bought a dog grooming business. Yes. And I'm like, you can buy a dog grooming business? And she did it from her home. Yes. This is in Illinois. Some things are more lax there. Anyhow, she, it was just a tickler file box of all her customers. And of course, you know, she had to probably learn some of the tips from the girl there. Right. I don't know. But she grew that business and she went to North Carolina and she changed the name and did whatever she needed to do. And she made good money. I mean, that was the first time I ever heard about somebody buying a business. And it basically was just the customer list, just an FYI. I'm glad you pointed that out because the pet services industry is the one industry that has been continually going up. Every other industry has been going down. The pet service industry keeps going up. And the reason for that being is that us baby boomers, our children are already grown and out. So we get pets. The millennials, they're waiting to have children. So they have pets. They have all this discretionary income that goes to their pets. You know, it's funny. We have a dog grooming business in, my, in the building and it is booming. Oh, yeah. And it's amazing how much people will spend on their dog. It, it, I mean, they don't treat people as well as they treat your own dog. It's actually embarrassing. We have a, a tent city right around the corner, and we have these poodles that come in and look shaggy. They come out looking like, you know, divas. And it's actually, and then you say, wow, human nature. The other important thing when you're buying a business is always to have a non compete clause at the end of it. And the reason I say, the pet services industry that, that you mentioned about is great, but I sold a barber shop one time with no non-compete clause in there. Well, what happens is the barber shop, the barber shop owner rented another space half block down the street mm -hmm. and put up another barber shop, and all his customers from his previous barber shop kept going to the other one. So it's like you got to make sure that you have a Non-compete clause in it. But the pet services industry would have been great if the woman had not given her, her the, the, the database of the customers. She could have kept all those cars. So you have to have a non-compete clause when you buy a business and make sure that the owner selling you the business is not going to compete against you right across the street. You know, I have a story. I had a a, a, a wife buy out the husband of the business. They had a gym business, and the attorney did not put in a non-compete. And it is absolutely insane. You talk about malpractice. So they bought the same thing, right, right. And the very next day, the wife ended up opening up the business, similar business, and got all the customers. And I'm saying, how is it possible? Because when you're a divorce attorney, you're selling businesses. Yeah. You're actually, the spouse is buying the other spouse out. Could be a rental, could be any, whatever. But this one was an actual business. And the attorney did not put in a non-compete. I said, boy, he must have been sleeping at the switch. <laughs> <laughs> that is a terrible lesson to learn. Yeah, that was also the very first big problem. That, 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 that happened with the very first McDonald's. Um, wasn't it the uh, milkshake salesman, wasn't it, Ray? Yeah. And uh, he went right across the street because they wouldn't sell them the first McDonald's. And then you see what happened from there. 
Since 2001, I have sold taco shops, coffee shops, full service restaurants, bag bars, wine bars, and nightclubs, hair salons, beverage shops, pet grooming service, retail stores, dry cleaners, wholesale operations, auto repair, car wash, smog shops, a plumbing and drain business, a concrete pouring business, and a residential care facilities. Oh. Those are just some of the businesses that I've sold. I've also sold like, a food truck, uh, numerous businesses that I've sold since 2001. Wow. Basically, what I'm saying is that. If you're thinking about buying and selling, contact me. Unfortunately, high percentage of businesses go on sold. Don't let that happen to you. I can and will help you sell a business. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I'm going to add a few things. Remember, Thank you, 10% of my commission will be going to this church. Thank you, everyone, for participating. We had a great class today. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few things that um, our Zoomers uh, noted in our uh, topics today. And I think Byron is probably the most um, close as far as understanding the difficulties in, in either maintaining wealth or maintaining your financial status. He says, you can fund your startup business or idea. How? Exactly how Walt Disney and JCPenney, Stanford University had more, had had to innovate when money denied help. Okay, I don't know if you understood that. You can fund your startup business or idea. How? Exactly how Walt Disney and JCPenney, Stanford University and more had to innovate when money was when money was denied help. Okay, the secret cash value life insurance. Build a bank, a family bank, self-funding tax-free cash. Okay, talk to Byron if you want more questions about that. Because money equals a bank. Okay, thank you all for participating. Any more questions or comments? Okay. Yes. She had a seizure this morning, so she's at the hospital. So her name is Nancy. So just keep her in your prayers, please. Yes, Lord. A lot of family members not doing well, and we'll just lift everybody up, Lord. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your tender mercies and. Bless this church, Lord, and our Entrepreneur for Christ class, Lord. We are here to honor you, to take guidance from you. And I just pray for miracles in this, in this classroom and in this church, Lord. I pray for Nancy, Lord. Only you know her woes and her the difficulties that she's had in her life, Lord. I just pray for special miracles and healing to abound in this family, Lord and just give them strength and wisdom to make the right decisions on what they need to do. And I just pray that you'll just put special people in their lives that will direct them accordingly, Lord. I pray for um, each member that may or may not be here today, if they have any illness or distresses, and just um, bless them, Lord, financially, physically, spiritually, Lord. And um, we lift up all the leaders in this class, Carlos and family, Robert, who's diligent and here on a timely basis. And I just thank you for your tender mercies and heal all the woes, Lord, in our county, because we have a lot of illnesses spreading around and kids want to get back to school and businesses want to flourish. I just pray for healing in our, in our San Diego County. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, really? Thanks. And our next week's speaker is Amanda. We're going to have Amanda, our bookkeeper, give us some highlights next week. So stay tuned. She has not confirmed. Loses, break even.